Good morning. Welcome to uh, our final King Institute lecture for this academic year. Um, glad to see you again. I'm is that a signal for me, Brian? Are you signaling me? Squeeze in if you can. That's the universal symbol for squeeze in. So, or I'm dancing badly. It's one of the two. I'm not sure which that is. Uh, thank you for being with us today for a time uh, yet again of quiet and reflection. This is a time uh, where we're privileged to have somebody who's traveled a long way, all the way from Vancouver, to be with us today as somebody who's done a lot of writing and a lot of thinking, and I'll let Erin introduce her in a moment. A couple of quick announcements by way of uh, housekeeping. If you want to spend some time with Sarah afterwards, we're going to go to the Tadlock House which is just across the Oval, and if you're visiting us, just look for me or Aaron, and we'll show you where to go. We'll have some coffee and donuts over there if you want to spend some time with Sarah. Also, if you want to join us for lunch, we'll be going over to lunch probably at 11, 1120, 1130, uh, and if you want to join us there, we'll have uh, plenty of time for relaxed conversation. Sarah is going to speak again tonight at 7 o'clock at Central Presbyterian Church in the Fellowship Hall. If you want to come join us then, you're very welcome. There's also CCS credit. You do have one other convocation opportunity after this, I guess honors convocation as well, which will make two more. Next Monday, the president will be here and he's going to be talking about uh, our new mission and vision statements, unpacking those a bit, and that also will count for CCS credit if you are in need, and some of you are because it is the end of the semester. So I'm gonna turn it over to Aaron to introduce our speaker, thank you. Good morning. Sarah Bessie, how to describe such a vibrant sister in Christ. Sarah is an internationally acclaimed writer, speaker, preacher, and in her words, recovering know-it-all. In her 2013 book, Jesus Feminist, which I bought immediately because I'd never known that my two favorite words could be wedded together so seamlessly, she reminds us that Jesus was the first feminist, speaking to women and treating them as equals in a time when this was mo most certainly not the normative path. In this book, she encourages women to stop fighting for a seat at the table and instead just be. Quote, let's sit here in hard truth and easy beauty, she writes, in the tensions of the now and the not yet of the kingdom of God, and let us discover how we can disagree beautifully." End quote. She reminds us that we don't have to do big things for God, that, quote, sometimes our most holy mountain-moving faith looks more like spending our whole lives making that mountain move, rock by rock, pebble by pebble, unsexy day after daily day, casting the mountain to the sea stone by stone, rather than watching a mountain suddenly rise up and cast itself." End quote. One of my favorite things she has written is a blog post entitled, Keep Not Quitting, in which she, she sagely advises, quote, people talk about victory, but sometimes it takes all of our energy to just not keep quitting. Oh, sorry, to just keep not. <laughs> just keep not quitting. Very important wording there. A quick scroll through her lovely, vibrant blog yields such gems of post titles such as, in which I am learning to live with the ache, something that resonates with me quite deeply. Why not have a women, woman preach, in which God doesn't look the same anymore? and even a beginner's guide to Doctor Who. Sarah is Canadian and currently lives in Vancouver, Lucky Duck, with her husband of over 16 years and four children, including one daughter named somewhat after Anne of Green Gables, yes, Anne with an E. She partners with social justice agencies such as Heartline Ministries, helping Haitian families with health care and education, and Help One Now, working all over the world to help save vulnerable orphans and children. She's also co-hosting an evolving faith conference with Rachel Held Evans this October in basically in our backyard, Montreat, North Carolina, which is so incredibly amazing that it's just, it's within driving distance of us. So you could find out more information about that if you just type in Sarah Bessie into your Google. 
She describes this conference as a two-day gathering for the wanderers, the wanderers, the status quo upenders, and the spiritual refugees. Basically, this is for you. We are beyond blessed to have Sarah with us here today. Please welcome Sarah Bessie. Let's, let's see if I manage to figure out a microphone. All right. Well, hi, everybody. I'm so glad that you're here. I was worried it would be just me and Martin, so this is nice. <laughs> Although I hear you get credit for this, so I'm not that excited. <laughs> well, I flew in yesterday from Vancouver on uh, Easter Sunday, and so I spent a little bit of time feeling sorry for myself, so it's nice to be with you all and, um, and to all be together. Um, Aaron, thank you for such a lovely introduction. That was incredibly kind, and, uh, and I'm just very grateful for that. Um, I think probably the only other thing to maybe warn you about right out the gate is that I love Jesus with my whole heart. I have zero chill on this matter at all. I cannot even pretend to play it cool. And so you just need to just almost brace yourself for how this is going to look moving forward. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit this morning about um, that first book that I wrote, which was called Jesus Feminist. And then this evening, I'll be talking a little bit more about the second book I wrote in 2015, which is called Out of Swords. And it's about making peace with an evolving faith, about what it is like when you find that your questions or your answers or the things that had always worked for you or you had known so clearly suddenly become a not enough or inadequate or you find yourself kind of crossing this threshold into your doubts or your questions and then what does it look like then um, as you're beginning to move forward into that. So we'll be talking about that a little bit more tonight. Um, so this morning I wanted to talk about um, Jesus Feminist because it's one of those things that always seems to get a little bit of a jolt out of people when they first hear my book title, which is always wonderful. Um, you know, I don't know anybody else who's managed to tick off as many people as I have with one two-word title, so I win. <laughs> A dubious distinction, perhaps. But yet, at the same time, it was one of those things that felt very easy for me to put together, um, because it was following Jesus that made a feminist out of me. I never found that it was something that I had to reconcile, or that it was something that felt like it was um, at war with itself, that instead it was because I love Jesus, because I was following Jesus, that I found myself on this path towards really wanting to embrace and understand and walk out what I believe is God's vision for women. Um, a lot of years ago when I began to first refer to myself as a feminist, and I would have been a lot younger then. Um, people in the churches where we were at, my husband was a pastor for a number of years, and we actually pastored in Texas for a number of years, um, which is a whole nother book. <laughs> and you're not all going to get me in trouble. I promised Martin I would avoid politics. Promised. Um, but one of the things that would happen is it was very easy for me to say things like, well, of course I'm a feminist. I'd worked with women my entire life. I was very passionate about women's issues, particularly within the church. And so I would say it very easily. I'd say, well, of course I'm a feminist. And I would sort of watch people take a step back and, you know, clutch their pearls. <laughs> and say, well, what kind of feminist? <laughs> and I think that the question was because they had never really equated someone who was like me with their notion of what they thought feminism was. A lot of times there were ideas of a stereotype or things that they had heard in the media or from leaders that actually um, amounted to a lot of stereotypes or caricatures or um, fear-mongering, a lot of misinformation. And they had a hard time squaring me, their pastor's wife, who was standing right in front of them, happily married and, you know, eventually the mother of children. And, you know, they just were like, I'm not as scared of you. You don't look like you're out to destroy everything. <laughs> I said, just wait. <laughs> but what was funny to me is that when I moved home, uh, back home to Canada, and it would be interesting to me how I would almost get the exact same reaction for the other word. Because I live in a uh, more of a secular post-Christian environment. Um, I would be at work at uh, the credit union or somewhere else, and I would say, well, it would eventually come out that I was a Christian, that I was someone who followed Jesus. And there was that same sharp intake of breath. And they would say, well, what kind of Christian? <laughs> 
And I think the reason why they were asking that is because a lot of times their idea of what a Christian was or who a Christian was was tricked out more from media or from what they read in the news or in, uh, in books that certainly, things that didn't do me a whole lot of favors, I'll say that. And so it was almost like they had a hard time squaring their idea of who someone who followed Jesus was like with the person that they knew loved them and was part of their lives. No matter what stereotypes um, people have oftentimes with either one of these words, it's something that I have found a lot of, of peace within. And I know that labels are imperfect. And some labels are more difficult for other people than others. And I'm certainly not here to you know, make any, any argument that you need to have the exact same experiences or, or reactions to these things that I do. But more just to share my story, I suppose. Because to me, at the core, feminism has always just been this radical notion that women are people too. That has really been the extent of it for me right from the start. And even at its baseline, the core definition of what that is looks a lot like equality. It looks a lot like reconciliation and like wholeness. And a lot of times people can think of it almost as a zero-sum game, that somehow the rising or the empowerment of women means the disempowerment or lowering of other people. And instead, what I have find that that is just not at all the case, that there's no such thing as a zero-sum game in the kingdom of God, that there is always more than enough, that there is always more room, and that the, the purpose of having women rise is not somehow to put other people at odds, but rather to see us all become the fullness of who God has intended us to be. Feminism for me has meant really that we champion the dignity and the rights and the responsibilities and even the glories of women as equal to that of men. And that's it. It hasn't meant something um, less than that, but certainly not more than that. And in fact, because I have followed Jesus so closely for so many years, I have come to the belief that the number one place where women should be flourishing is in the body of Christ. That this should be the number one place where women are flourishing, where women are courageously rising to the full capacity that God has placed within them. And for not only the, the commissioning and work within the church, but for the, the healing of the world. That really we are the answer, that we are the ones who are here and we are part of that. And yet at times it can often feel as though women are being asked to become less in the church. To become less of a leader, to become more quiet, to become less of who maybe God has called her to be, to hold back her full strength, to become less dangerous and less awake, even a lot of times to shrink your body to a very socially acceptable size. And it's even more complicated for women of color, for indigenous women, for women who experience any number of intersections with their womanhood, or how we as a, as a culture perceive that or expect that to be. And that's different, obviously, for every place. I mean, the way that you guys understand womanhood or that your culture does here within King might be very different than it is for me, you know, on the West Coast in Canada. And those are things that every community has to grapple with and begin to understand and separate from or, or, or critically look at. But one of the things that I have found is that what really turned the corner for me of being able to embrace both being a follower of Jesus and being someone whose who's feminism is deeply shaped by that was really actually starting off like any good Protestant in scripture. And of course, I'm also charismatic, so heads up, I'm a bit of a sloppy, sloppy person here in the midst of all of this too. You should always be glad I left my tambourines at home. <laughs> It's adorable you think I'm kidding. <laughs> we totally wave flags in my church and I'm happy about it. <laughs> Jesus' encounters with women told such a different story to me than oftentimes the narrative of what I was being told actually I was meant to be in the church and then let alone how I was meant to show up in the world as someone who was a disciple of Jesus. And after years and years of reading the Gospels and studying the can of, canons of Scripture and reading through church history, here's really simply and, and succinctly what I have learned about how Jesus is with ladies. He loves us. That he loved us. And the stories of who Jesus is in our lives and the way that Jesus interacted with and related to women gave me such a path of hope and goodness. And I believe gives all of us a path of goodness and hope as we move forward because he treated us as equals to the men around him. That we were never perceived as being too weak or too emotional or too dangerous to be included in the awakening of the church that he honored us and he challenged us and he taught us and he was friends with us. 
And a lot of times these things just flew in the face of the cultural expectations of his time in a time when women were almost entirely silent or invisible in literature. Scripture makes a point of over and over and over again affirming and celebrating and centering women. That we were a part of Jesus' entire ministry and life and oftentimes we're the very first ones at the cradle and the last ones at the cross. And that these, these were things that mattered to me. Over and over there were these stories of women in scripture. If you have a chance to begin to read through, the, read through the Gospels with this lens in place of looking and searching for how Jesus interacted with women, it is very deeply transformative for you. There's a woman who touched the hem of his garment and was healed. There are the women who were counted among his disciples, like Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Susanna. And, uh, scripture tells us that not only did they travel with Jesus and minister alongside of him, but they were bankrolling it. And I gotta tell you, I love ladies who can bankroll. <laughs> There is just something so good about that to me. There was uh, this one really small story in scripture that I found really striking when you begin to study the context. It's the story of a woman who was so crippled that she was bent over almost entirely in half looking at the floor. And Jesus encounters her in the temple on a Sabbath and he heals her. And the religious leaders, of course, just cannot deal with the fact that this has happened. And they rebuke him for it. And he says, is not a daughter of Abraham worth as much as any lamb that had gone over the cliff? If a lamb had gone over, one of your lambs had gone over the cliff, would you not have gone down and rescued it? And is not this daughter of Abraham worth just as much of a rescue? And the reason why that was electrifying is not simply because it's, it's beautiful and redemptive and true, but also because it was the first time anyone had ever used the phrase daughter of Abraham. There had only ever been sons of Abraham. Women had never been fully included in the covenant before this, at least culturally. And in that one statement, Jesus is saying, no, 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 the daughters of Abraham are just as much present, just as much heirs to the covenant and the work that I'm doing in the world as anyone else. You know, you can go on and on through scripture, the story of the woman at the well, which is an amazing story to read through feminist lens. There are the stories about his mother, about the woman caught in adultery, about Mary and Martha, about uh, Mary of Bethany, the sinful woman who anointed his feet, but because it's Easter, or it was Easter yesterday, it's Easter Monday back where I'm from. We all have the day off from school, so it sucks to be you. <laughs> can you say that in church? I don't know if you can. <laughs> Fix it, Jesus. Okay. Because it's Easter weekend, one of my favorite stories actually with Jesus' encounters with women happened on this weekend with Mary Magdalene. Because what happened is, is after the crucifixion, after he has died and he has been buried in the tomb, she returns to the tomb to, to weep and to mourn and to cover him with spices and to have this, this moment of grief. Uh, one of the things I found was really interesting in a lot, of, um, a lot of sermons that sometimes we'll skip over is the fact that oftentimes people deserted Jesus during that time, betrayed him, left him, abandoned him, or just simply walked away because really what they were after was what Jesus could do for them. And instead, with Mary and with a lot of the other women who were there, they simply wanted Jesus. That it didn't matter what he did or didn't do, that he didn't overthrow the Romans, that he had died, that they still just wanted him. And so she's there at the, uh, at the tomb, and so she goes to the tomb before sunrise, and she sees that the stone's being rolled away. And so she panics, and she runs back to get Simon Peter and John, who then... Um, decide that she's convinced, of course, that someone has taken Jesus' body from the tomb. And so they come back with her, look inside and confirm that, yes, in fact, Jesus' body isn't there. So it's very nice. Thank you, gentlemen, for confirming the word of a woman. That's really lovely. <laughs> it's nice that we don't need to have things like that happen anymore, isn't it? <laughs> and then they return home. And she stays there. And she's weeping because she's convinced that someone has taken him. And then in that moment, she looks inside again, and there's two angels who are sitting there, and they ask her why she's weeping. And she says, they've taken my Lord, and I don't know where they've taken him. If you know where he is, can you tell me? And then she turns away, and she sees a man that she thinks is the gardener. And he asks her why she's weeping. And so she repeats it again. She says, they've taken my Lord, and I don't know where they've, they've put him. If you know where he is, would you tell me where he is? And then in that moment... He says her name. I will never get over this. And he says her name. He says Mary. And in that moment, she looks up and she recognizes him. She sees him. And the very next thing that Jesus says, I love this with my whole heart, 
The very next thing that Jesus says after that is, don't cling to me so tightly. <laughs> and you know, there are a lot of people who are much smarter than I am, who have said a lot of things about what this means, about the ascension and theological implications and resurrection and coming into your body in the 40 days and blah, blah, blah. They're probably all right. But there is a little part of me that has always believed that really she just launched herself at him. <laughs> I mean, maybe because I have this household of small humanity, I have four children, but they can, they can hug a little lead that feels like strangling. And I wonder if it was a bit of that strangle hug that just sort of happened in that moment that she just launched herself at him. And it almost feels like this sense of like, you're hugging me too hard. <laughs> you know, give me a second to catch my breath. And so then he commissions her to go and tell the disciples. He commissions her as the first preacher of the resurrection. And he sends her out and says, you need to go and tell everybody what you have seen, that I have risen, that I'm alive. And so she goes out saying, I, I've seen him, he's alive, he's risen from the dead. The very first preacher of the resurrection. And you know what, I will tell you this, just very honestly, it would have been a lot tidier for the early church if they had picked someone else. It would have been. I mean, we're talking about a time in history when the word of a woman was not considered sufficient evidence in court. I know you can't even imagine such a time. Getting quiet in this Baptist church. <laughs> but instead, Jesus appeared to a woman. And he commissioned her to go out and tell people, believing that that would be enough, that that would be the place that he would say. It seemed like this almost a sense of holy subversion to it, that I just love with my whole heart, that he just simply did it, that he commissioned her and sent her out. And he thought that she just had the capacity for what this would be and what this would mean for the world. One of the things, there's an, um, an author that I really like. Her name is uh, Carolyn Custis James. She's an amazing woman and scholar. Uh, she's written a number of books. I should probably be getting a cut from her publisher for how often I recommend them, to be honest. I'm like a one-man marketing team. Um, and she wrote a book called uh, Half the Church, and inside it she says that patriarchy may be the backdrop of the Bible, but it's not the mandate of the Bible. And I think that that's a really important distinction to make in a lot of these conversations because, in fact, we can even trace this inbreaking of the kingdom of God, this setting things right, of undoing and resetting the curse of patriarchy through the kingdom of God, through the people of God. And throughout Scripture, Jesus overturned or, or, or simply walked past and embodied a better and truer way of ways that were meant to exclude and oppress and dehumanize women. Over and over again, he did these things. So a lot of times people will ask me, they'll say, why did you write the book Jesus Feminist? And there's a lot of answers for that. I think probably my first answer is usually, I think the better question is why it was necessary. Is why, why something like that would even be necessary. And yet here we are. And that is, that is something that was, I don't think I realized when I very first was writing it back in 2012, how deeply relevant and important it would be for the conversations we'd be having as a church right now. Which I think leads, again, back to the fact that I'm one of those happy, clappy, charismatic people who does believe in the active and intimate leading of the Holy Spirit. And I think that it's probably a good thing that all of these things have kind of intersected at this moment. Because it's my belief that a lot of the seminal social justice issues of our time, the things that are keeping us up at night, the things that are making us angry, that a lot of those things do trace their way back to a lot of these, what Pentecostals like me like to call powers and principalities. Right? These things that we are fighting against as opposed to one another. And I don't know real, I know a lot of people struggle sometimes with that sort of language because it feels really big, but I love that kind of language because I don't know really what other term to use about what feels like a, the powers and principalities of an age that looks like patriarchy and sexism and abuse and war and racism and um, a number of other different things that feel almost bigger than just simply the people that are sitting behind. It feels like the spirit of an age. And so these are the things that we are undoing and we are resetting. These are the things that we are overturning and making right. And so for me, when I could no longer pretend or turn my eyes away from the fact that women, even the women in our churches, the women in our communities, the women in your family, likely the women in this room, are more likely to die by male violence, usually from someone they know, than from war, malaria, traffic accidents. Um, I want to say there was another one, war, traffic accidents, cancer, combined. That you're more likely to die from male violence than from those four things combined. 
that one third of women are facing abuse at home and up to 70% of mur female murder victims are usually killed by a man who knows them and claim to love them. When you know that women worldwide are suffering from unequal access to education and to land and to even just basic human rights, when you find out that little girls are having, being shot in the head for the crime of daring to go to school, or having acid thrown in their face for leaving an abusive husband. When you see, um, as you are heading out into the world and you are getting your jobs and you are beginning to realize what e not getting equal pay for equal work actually looks like on your budget. When you see how sometimes when you're flipping through a magazine that high fashion thinks it's really a great way to sell shoes if you depict sexualized violence against women. And you see even the reckoning that is happening in our culture right now with the Me Too movement, the Time's Up movement, and even the Church Too movement. Because I cannot tell, me, tell you how many young girls I talked to who met their Harvey Weinstein at youth group. Or at their college campus. All with the guys and wrapping up all of that abuse and a lot of spiritual abuse at the same time, which then tangles together everything. These statistics and these stories are not just statistics to me, they're people. They're my friends, they're people I have loved and known, because behind every single one of them there is a story. These aren't things that we are talking about dispassionately because we're the church, we're the people of God, we care. And we notice and we see, especially the ones whom our culture would rather ignore and oppress and marginalize and turn a blind eye from and pretend that everything is fine. We're the ones who have an eye casting across that room saying, we see you. We see you, and we love you, and we want to be part of your healing. I think that God is at work in the world, and we as the church have been invited to participate fully and completely in all of that. However God has gifted and equipped and called you, that that is part of your work, that's part of your goodness that you get to embrace in the world. Because, you know, and I understand that not everybody loves the word feminist, and that is fine. Just like not everybody loves the word Christian. Right? There's a lot of people who have baggage attached to either one of these words, and that's fine. And yet, at the same time, as long as I know how deeply important maternal health is for Haiti's future, and as long as I know that there are women being abused and raped, likely here on your campus, in your homes and in your families, and as long as I know that there are girls being denied life itself through selective abortion and abandonment all around the world, that there are little girls who are being shot for daring to try to go to school, and as long as women are being silenced and minimized in the name of God, and as long as there are still women coming to me because their churches and their pastors are encouraging them to stay with the man who beats them because somehow it will glorify God. And until being a Christian is synonymous with caring about those things and doing something about them, then I'm completely fine adding the word feminist to my life. My hope is, is that being a Christian becomes synonymous with that, that it becomes the same thing, that it means the same thing. And until that happens, then it is something that we want to be able to actually articulate and move into. And here's the reason why. The reason why is because patriarchy, which is a big scary word for a lot of people I know, and yet it represents that spirit, that powers and principalities that I was talking about, this thing that enslaves not only women but men, that is so toxic and hurting us and poisoning us, that this thing of patriarchy, that it is not God's dream for us, that it was never God's dream for us. It never was and it never will be. I think that scripture has made it incredibly clear that patriarchy is the consequence of the fall and that we have been redeemed from that curse because of Jesus Christ. And so that might be the reality for the world, for the way that the culture understands relationships between men and women and how we are to be in the world. But yet for us as the body of Christ, our citizenship being in the kingdom of God, that we're not interested in propping up and baptizing with sacred language stuff that is part of the curse. I'm not interested in, in pretending that somehow this can be made sacred when it is something that is actually from the world and not part of who God is. Because in Christ, in Jesus, I think that we are called to participate fully in the inbreaking of the kingdom of God, of making things right, of embodying and walking out what it looks like when men and women are walking in wholeness and goodness and restoration together. A lot of that, I think, is because, well, and I'll, I'll tell you this too, as someone who's been married for, for a long time now, 17 years, some of you probably almost as long as you've been alive, which is really depressing. 
And also as someone who's a mom of four, I have three daughters and a son, I think it is absolutely vital for me to rise to the full capacity that God has given me because not only does the world need me to be fully alive and not only does the church need me to be fully alive and engaged, but my husband and my children, they need to see me walking in the fullness of the anointing and the gifting and the strengths that God has placed within me. That that is important for them to have in their presence and in their life, but also in how we are as a family. One thing that my husband has a very deep conviction about that I'm incredibly grateful for is that he has never believed that I needed to become less so he would be more. He has never acted like I needed to become less of who I am in order to make him somehow feel better. Because his strength and his goodness and his integrity is not rooted in my diminishment. We arise together in fullness and in goodness, that we spur one another on, that we encourage one another, we sharpen one another, we celebrate and honor one another. You know, marriage is not a zero-sum game either. That there is something else that can be happening in this place, that we're healthier and happier and stronger when we realize that we do not rise alone, that we are rising together, and that that is part of how we love one another, that's a part of how we celebrate one another and encourage one another and embody what it looks like that whole mystery of Jesus in the church. You know, I think that we can oftentimes choose to move with God further into justice and wholeness, or we can keep choose to continue to prop up the world's dead systems and broken habits. One of my favorite passages of Scripture, and in case you haven't noticed, I say that about every single one of them, and I mean it every time. One of my favorite passages of Scripture happens actually right at Pentecost, which is 40 days from now. It's over in Acts chapter 2, which of course I'm charismatic, so of course I love everything to do with Pentecost. <laughs> and it's right in Acts chapter 2, right at the beginning there, it says, Without warning, there was a sound like a strong wind, gale force, no one could tell where it came from, it filled the whole building. And then like a wildfire, the Holy Spirit spread through their ranks and they started speaking in a number of different languages as the Spirit prompted them. So they pour into the streets. Peter starts to preach and he pulls back to these passages from the prophet Joel and begins to reveal how this is this moment, this moment right now in time is deeply connected to what has been prepared and planned this whole way through. And he says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on every kind of people. Your sons will prophesy, also your daughters. Your young will see visions, your old will dream dreams. When the time comes, I will pour out my spirit on those who serve me, men and women both, and they will all prophesy. You know what, and I love the word prophesy, not because I think that we need necessarily anybody to write a book about 88 reasons why Jesus is coming back in 1988, or any other form of end times, you know, secrets, finding in Daniel and whatever else. I mean, if that's your thing, knock yourself out. But I think that the bigger thing that we are prophesying and that we are pointing towards is God's new world. The thing that we are prophesying is the resurrection, renewal, rescue, and redemption of everything. And that your life right now is that prophetic outpost. Your life as it stands, your relationships with other women, your relationships with men, your relationships with your spouse or your partner, your relationships with children, your relationships with the church, all of these things are ways that you are prophesying to God's new world. They're all tipping your hand about what you really believe about the nature and character of God, about who you are in the world right now. You know, in the, uh, back during the uh, times of the ancient church, there was a, someone who once really famously said that the, that the church is a place that is filled with women, slaves, and children. That it was a religion for children, uh, women, and slaves. And the reason why that is, and to me I think that's a great compliment, even though they meant it as a, meant it as a criticism, is because it was a place where women felt safe. Where people who were oppressed and rolled over by the Roman Empire felt safe where they could actually challenge and learn and lead and be equal. The church has always been made up of women like Junia, the apostle, whom the apostle Paul called chief among the apostles in scripture, honored her as being a leader among leaders. You know, that's one of the things about Paul, too, that I find just incredibly fascinating. And oftentimes people will um, have a hard time with Paul, especially women. And whenever people would like to paint Paul with like this misogynistic brush that somehow he wanted women to be silent in church and never speak, 
I really wish they loved their Bible enough to read the whole thing, because let me tell you what. Paul loved women. He affirmed and celebrated and worked alongside of women. He commissioned women as leaders. A lot of the reason why even like you look at um, the book of Philippians, why it was so warm and so filled with joy, people often wonder, what's the, the different tone in this letter? I'll tell you why. The church of Philippi was almost entirely made up of and pastored and led by women. He loved these women. And there were women like Junia the Apostle. He was the one who wrote over in, Gal in his letter to the Galatians that in Christ's family there can be no division into Jew and non-Jew, slave and free, male and female. Among us, we are all equal because we are all in common relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul cared about the gospel being preached. Period. That is what he cared about. He cared about God's new world. He worked with and ordained women in the early church, not as tokens, but as powerful preachers and evangelists and leaders in their own right. We have a legacy of Christian tradition behind us of women who have seen that the hope of the gospel resides in them and that they are full partners and fully, at, fully active with their brothers in Christ. We have a legacy of believers who were drawn to dismantle these curses of patriarchy because of their deep Christian faith, not in spite of it. Because I think that the church knew right from Pentecost that the mistreatment and dehumanization of women, that somehow the um, diminishment of women was not and never would be and never had been part of God's plan and purpose for us. And so they were moved to act for justice in ways that were both big and small all the way throughout history. And so we're just part of that continuing and ongoing story. It's not something that came on church like a fit in the 20th century. That this is part of our roots. This is part of who we are. And so a big part of me would really love to see the church reclaim our historic place as a safe place for women. I would love for the church, for your homes, for your relationships, to be an equipping and safe and generative and challenging and loving place for women. Because I believe that the daughters of the earth are really crying out for justice right now. And at this moment, I think that we're seeing it in a way that perhaps we never had before. There is a reckoning happening in our culture. The emperor has no clothes, and it turns out never did. And people in the first world or in the developing world are caught in between. They are really buried in the world's power structures of sexism and um, authority and patriarchy and war and economic injustice and systemic racism. These things are burying us alive. And so there's this one theologian who has said that as the people of God, we are called to bravely erect in the here and now and in the teeth of these structures signs of God's new world. That that's part of what our work is. And those signs include the women of God walking beloved and free and secure, proclaiming the gospel into every corner of our lives. Because I believe at this moment in time, we need women who are warriors. And we need men who are warriors. That we need women who believe that Jesus meant all those things that he said. It's absolutely bananas. <clears throat> that we need women who are both warriors and worshipers. That we need poets and pragmatists. We need prophets and policy makers. That we need grandmothers and elders and mums and daughters and a few saucy aunties. That we need women like Mary Magdalene who preached the resurrection. That we need leaders like Junia and Deborah, and Ruth, and Priscilla, and, June, and, um, and Esther. That we need courageous women who are rising with the full awareness of everybody who came before, behind us, everybody who is alongside of us, and who is missing from alongside of us, and who is coming up ahead of us. And that we are part of this redemption, and this renewal, and this rescue, right now with Jesus in the midst of all of it. So I have a few minutes here, and I'd like to pray for you. Is that all right, Martin? Okay, I figured it would be fine, but you know, you want to check. And I know the way that I pray may not be the way that you pray, and I hope that there is room for that. Um, and if not, just, you know, pretend you're praying. So let's do this. King, I pray that love will rise in you and through you. I pray that you would be someone who would come to know that sort of all-encompassing, resurrecting, wonder-working love deeply and intimate, that you would have a hunger and a thirst for God. And I pray that you would be satisfied, that you would make your home in love, that you would make love your discipline and your resting place, your practice, your doctrine, 
your plumb line and your identity. I pray that you somehow in your life right now, as it stands, not someday when you have it all together, but right now in your life, that you would find a path to celebrate and equip and honor women. That you would push back on these old lies from the world that women are insecure and jealous or emotional or like somehow that's a bad thing. By how you love and champion and empower women. I pray that you would become a voice of truth and boldness, that you would wrestle with your own story until you own it, body and soul, and have learned how to make it sing. I pray that you would become women of possibility and hope, that you would become people who know what it is to rise up above cynicism and bitterness into a vision of what is possible and what is happening around us that is, that is good and healing, and that you would, that would develop into this resolution that looks a lot like faithfulness. And I pray that the right women would come into your life at the right time. And I pray that you would be open to finding them, that you would always be watching for signs of your people. I pray that you would be surrounded by women who are loving and championing and leading, who, women who are dreamers and schemers, who live a little bit outside of that good Christian lady box. I pray that somebody clutches their pearls over you. I pray that you would be tireless, but you would also know what it is to rest well. And I pray for spiritual midwives in your life, women who will breathe alongside of you, who will work alongside of you as you are giving birth to a new version of yourself over and over and over again. I pray for friends and for mentors and authors and leaders and preachers and people to come alongside of you, to join you in your rising. I pray that you would be alongside of women who would invite you to go deeper, who make you more real and more honest, more human, to who would know who you are today and call out who you are becoming. And because we're at university, I pray for acceptance letters and scholarships, for opportunities for you to do the work that you love to do, and I pray that you would have equal pay when you do it. I pray that the women of the lineage of our faith would inspire you, that you would know their stories in Scripture and in history and in your own circles. I pray that you would begin to get curious about women and amplify their influence and their voices, that you would find good female leaders to also follow, good leaders who will influence you and call you out and mentor you and coach you and teach you and challenge you and push you. And I pray that the places where the world has broken you, where evil has left its mark, where maybe you have been one of those women who has felt abandoned and broken and hurt, where I pray that those of us among us who know that they are not just a statistic in this room. First of all, we bless you. And we love you. Jesus calls you beloved in that moment. And so I pray that all the places where you have had pain, that that would become a wellspring of healing and wholeness for you. I pray that all of your deserts would bloom with flowers. And I pray for the places in you that feel like dry, parched earth to begin to overflow with cleansing rain and healing waters. I pray for your healing, sister. I pray for your healing and I pray for your wholeness. I pray for your boldness and I pray that your voice would rise, that you would witness a new thing being born and that your very place of death would become a site of glorious and unexpected resurrection. I pray that you would begin to pay attention to both your anger and your joy because I have found that usually your calling is hiding somewhere at that intersection. I pray that you would be a community who are a friend to the poor and to the oppressed and the marginalized, not just an ally or an activist, but a friend. And finally, in the name of Jesus, I tell, I tell you and I speak to you to stop waiting for permission because it's time. You have been given permission. And I pray that you would begin to rise up with your gifts and your words and your passion your insight, your skill, your brain, your perspective, your history, everything gathered together, your ancestors, everything leading you up to this moment full in the fullness of God. And so I pray that when you are tired and discouraged, when you feel futile and small and just a bit ridiculous, 
when it is really tempting to give up and shrink back, I pray for rest and for renewal. I pray for more faith and for fearlessness and boldness and courage for new vision and for new life to come in ways that will surprise and bless you in that moment. And so may you now rest in your God-breathed worth. You would stop holding your breath and hiding your gifts and ducking your head and dulling your roar, distracting your soul, stilling your hands, quieting your voice, and satiating your hunger for the lesser things of this world because you are right now set apart in your right now life for the daily work of liberation and love, that you would live your life in the cadence of the redeemed and the resurrected. And it is in the name of Jesus that I want to send you out to the place where you already are to embody and walk out what it looks like when there is reconciliation and goodness and hope for women among you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, folks, I'll see you, I guess, over at the reception. Just by way of reminder, reception is in a building called Tadlock. If you're visiting us, it's over that way. Lunch at about 11.30.